From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, I'm David Weston. Welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. Later this hour, we're going to get the latest on those stimulus talks when Speaker Nancy Pelosi joins us for an exclusive interview. That's at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time. But first, let's get a check on the markets, where they are right now. Joining us, Abigail Doolittle. So, Abigail, how are we doing? You know, there's a bit of a risk on tone, David. Some jitters as well, because we haven't been just solidly higher. At one point, the tech-heavy Nasdaq actually turned down. But right now, we are close closer to session highs than not. The S&P 500 up about six tenths of 1%. So I think after yesterday's late day sell off that came on fears that stimulus will not happen, uh, certainly before the election, you today have uh, perhaps calmer heads prevailing or hope, more hope that maybe something will get done. So you have the S&P 500 up about six tenths of 1%, really being helped out by the cyclical sectors, including the financials. Uh, bonds earlier had been solidly lower. So now that they are uh, mix, David. So not uh, quite as risk on there, but nonetheless, the 10 year yield popping a little bit higher right now, helping the banks. We also have energy higher, even with oil down. But again, a little bit of a reopening flavor and overall the bulls trying to hang on here, David. And having all, uh, I understand the tech is selling off a little bit. It's a little soft. One might think that that would have to do with Google and the antitrust suit, but that's not doing the worst, right? Google's not actually getting hit all that badly. Well, you know, it's interesting. So earlier today, uh, Al Alphabet had actually been popping sharply higher, up about 1% on that news, largely priced in the idea that the U.S. is filing this antitrust lawsuit, 11 uh, Republican uh, state uh, attorneys general as well. Not so surprising, the overhang. We've had lots of shots across the bows with these executives, CEOs of these big tech companies appearing big for Congress over the last couple of years. Uh, but uh, not so long ago, it had been down about four tenths of 1%, now up ever so slightly. So investors really trying to figure out what this means. Many experts saying that it could take a very long time for this to go through the courts. And of course, the company itself saying uh, that they're not forcing consumers to use their product. It's the strength of their product and that they will certainly uh, fight it. But I think the other question you were asking was about Amazon. Those shares have been weak. So it's gonna be interesting to see what that company reports next week on Thursday and how strong or not strong that Prime Day was. Always have to keep an eye on this fan complex, David. Never a dull day. Okay, Abigail, thank you so much for that report on the markets. All this week, we're taking a look at Pennsylvania as part of our Swing State series. And today, we welcome Congressman Brendan Boyle. He's a Democrat from Philadelphia to take us through the race from his perspective. So, Congressman, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, before we get to the general gist of what's going on in Philadelphia, let's talk about that stimulus in your district. We're going to talk with Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi a short time from right now. How much are people counting on that fourth round of stimulus before the election in Northeast Philadelphia? It's great to be with you. And, you know, it's enormously frustrating, though, that the Senate has now refused to act on two different House bills that we've passed. We passed $3.4 trillion in the original HEROES Act back in May, May 15th. And then more recently, in kind of a last ditch effort to reach some sort of a compromise, we brought that down from $3.4 trillion to $2.2 trillion. And we passed that a few weeks ago. Unfortunately, Senator McConnell uh, has put neither bill on the, uh, on the Senate floor. I can tell you that in Northeast Philadelphia, as well as the, the entire city and area, that funding would be huge for us, especially the state and local piece. Um, remember, most state governments and city governments have balanced budget amendments. They're highly dependent upon tax revenues, which are based on economic activity. The state of Pennsylvania's budget, as well as the city of Philadelphia's budget, they've both just been devastated by the loss of economic activity, and it's all because of COVID. And let's talk, let's talk about the election, if we could, and where we're going with this election. We know that Philadelphia, particularly your district, tends to go blue. I mean, as I understand it, Hillary Clinton won in 2016, but by less than President Obama won in your district. How is Joe Biden stacking up right now in your district? Yeah, you know, the, the fact that Philadelphia, which is fifth biggest city in the country, a million and a half people, um, the northeastern part of the city, which is about 400,000 people, tends to get obscured. Uh, Northeast Philadelphia, if it were its own city, would be the second biggest city in Pennsylvania. Um, and it's uh, it leans Democratic, but not nearly as much as the rest of the city. So in 2012, Barack Obama won Northeast Philadelphia by 18 points. In 2016, Hillary won it, but only by seven points. So that 11-point drop-off, mostly due to a drop-off uh, among um, blue-collar working class uh, Democrats and independent uh, Democratic leaning independents was the main reason why you had that 11 point drop off. 
So what you saw in Northeast Philadelphia, you also saw in Northeastern Pennsylvania. You also saw in Erie, some seven hours away. And that was a big reason why we went from carrying Pennsylvania by five points in 2012 to losing it by under one point in 2016. So those, those blue-collar Democrats and independents that you refer to, Congressman, have they changed their mind? Do you have a sense of where yeah, they've changed I, their mind? And why have they changed their mind? Yeah, the good, news, the good news from my perspective is that first in 2018, we saw us winning back those blue-collar voters, not just in my area, but also out in western Pennsylvania, some five hours uh, away. Um, what you've seen uh, and what I've seen in my own polling and even just the anecdotal interactions that I've had with constituents is a real Trump fatigue. Um, Donald Trump is, is not popular in Northeast Philadelphia. There were a certain number of people who didn't like either candidate in 2016 and took a shot on Trump, and they have really soured on him. I would also say, though, that part of the credit goes to Joe Biden. I mean, he really does connect very well with both blue collar voters, which you need, as well as the suburban Philadelphia voters, which are moving into the Democratic column in the highest numbers that we've ever seen in, in at least a generation. Uh, what about the fracking well, in issue? Because that's something that President Trump certainly has gone after the former vice president on, presumably because it affects uh, employment through the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, is President Trump winning on that issue? Yeah, I, President Trump really doesn't understand Pennsylvania, which is amazing because he, he, he went for two years to the University of Pennsylvania, which is in Philadelphia. Fracking is an important part of the economy in western Pennsylvania. It is not at all a factor in the eastern part of the state, which is where the majority of Pennsylvania's population resides. Uh, talk to us about the voting process in Pen Pennsylvania, because there's a lot of concern across the country with a lot more absentee ballots, mail-in ballots, in part because of COVID-19, let's be honest. There's been some back and forth even within Pennsylvania about how long they can count the votes that went up to the Supreme Court and with a 4-4 a vote actually upheld the possibility of counting for, I think, three days after the election. Where is the voting process in Philadelphia? I, this is something that concerns me. Um, first, this will be our, for Pennsylvania, this will be our first general election having widespread vote by mail. And it's mostly because of the pandemic. Uh, it will be my first general election uh, voting by mail, voting early. Um, it would be great if we were able to begin the processing of those ballots before election day. Unfortunately, the Republican controlled legislature has said that you have to wait until election day to begin even the processing of those ballots because uh, for pretty complicated reasons and two different envelopes, et cetera, it will take several days to count the millions of vote by mail ballots that we are expecting. Uh, six million people voted in Pennsylvania in the last presidential election. We're expecting at least that much in 2020 and already more than three million have requested ballots by mail. So unless the Republican legislature relents and lets the processing of those ballots to begin earlier, uh, we won't have a final tally in Pennsylvania probably until Friday or Saturday after Election Day. So this is terribly so important, terrible. potentially, Congressman, because Pennsylvania, as I've said, is really key. It certainly was last time in 2016. It was a narrow win for President Trump in Pennsylvania, plus Michigan, very narrow win. It may be that we won't know the results of the presidential election until seven days later if, in fact, it takes that long for Pennsylvania. Yeah, I, I'm not just saying this because I, I'm, I'm proud of my home state, but I think Pennsylvania is the keystone uh, for both Donald Trump and Joe Biden. It's really hard to come up with a plausible map that gets either candidate to 270 without our 20 electoral votes. Now, if it turns out the final national popular vote margin is not that close, say Joe Biden is winning Florida, they have, by the way, the kind of rule that I would like here in Pennsylvania, they begin processing their absentee ballots or votes by mail almost immediately as they come in before Election Day, which is why when the polls close in Florida, they're able to report the majority of their ballots almost instantaneously. So in Florida, uh, which is ironic for what we all experienced 20 years ago, <laughs> but Florida is actually light years ahead of, of where we are right now with vote by mail. If Joe Biden is winning Florida on election night, then that will probably show that, that it is over and he has won. If Florida and North Carolina stay in the Republican column, then it will be down to Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. 
and then we might be in store for a few day wait. Yeah, a bumpy yeah. ride indeed. Okay, thank you so much, Congressman. Really great to have you with us. That's Congressman Brendan Boyle, Democrat of Pennsylvania. Coming up, we're going to get much more on the stimulus talks, talking to the Speaker of the House herself, Nancy Pelosi. She'll be joining us for an exclusive interview. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Well, it's been a long time coming, but th this morning, the Department of Justice finally, supported by 11 Republican state attorneys general, brought its big antitrust action accusing Google of violating Section 2 of the Sherman Act, the provision against monopolization. We welcome now Jennifer Ree. She's Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Analyst for Antitrust Litigation. So, Jen, thanks so much for being with us. You're the authority here. I know it's a 60-page complaint, a lot to d d digest. You've also been on the conference call. Tell us what we know. Oh, well, thanks for having me, David. Um, you know, we expected this complaint. Obviously, it's been sort of foreshadowed for quite a long time. And it looks like it is a little narrower than it might have otherwise been. Um, what, what the DOJ is alleging here is that Google is essentially foreclosing search engine rivals by entering into exclusive agreements with distributors, which could be device manufacturers, wireless carriers, or browser developers, um, either you know, exclusive agreements or paying them off, paying Apple money to uh, install Google as the default and prohibit the use of Google's rivals. And this forecloses competitors and basically just blocks off competition um, in search. And they also say that Google you know, monetizes its search with search ads. Obviously, that's the main way it makes it makes its revenues, and that it uses all this money it's making from search ads to pay these other companies to block out its rivals. And, and uh, I think that's the main gist of the suit. And one of the things that struck me was uh, reportedly the order of magnitude here. As I understood it, they were saying that Google may spend as much as $8 billion a year with Apple to be the default search engine here. Uh, Google then comes back and says, well, people use this only because we're better. If they're better, then why do they have to pay $8 billion a year to be the default? You know, that's exactly right. And what the DOJ would say and what generally, you know, the aim of the antitrust laws would be is to say you should get on there as the default because you are the best, not because you've paid somebody off and might not be the best, but because you are. And, and so consumers desire your product and therefore you're installed. And that's, you know, the way Google should be competing rather than paying device manufacturers. At least, you know, that is what this DOJ lawsuit says. Yeah, now, to go through this carefully under Section 2 of the Sherman Act, uh, it's not illegal to be a monopoly. It's illegal to either get to be a monopoly or stay a monopoly through anti-competitive actions. On the flip side, normally in, in commerce, you can pay somebody to get an exclusive listing. Is the problem here that they are so dominant in search and they pay? You know, yes, it's both. So in order to satisfy a Section 2, a Sherman Act Section 2 claim, first, you do have to show that a company has a monopoly in a certain product or service area, which I think is fairly easy to do here with Google with general Internet search. And then second, you have to show that that company has engaged in anti-competitive conduct to maintain or acquire that monopoly. Now, in this case, I see this as a fairly traditional allegation. You know, what the DOJ is saying here is that Google has entered exclusive uh, agreements, and we call it exclusive dealing in antitrust, as you probably remember <laughs> from your days practicing, David. And when exclusive deals, whether it's you know explicitly exclusive because of the terms of the deal or de facto exclusive because the company is being paid so much that nobody else can get in there, and it forecloses a substantial portion of the market to rivals, it becomes an antitrust um, allegation. It becomes illegal under the antitrust laws. Companies can enter exclusive agreements, and they do, and they can be perfectly lawful if they don't foreclose a substantial portion of the market. So the allegation here is that Google has entered so many of these contracts um, with so many of the uh, uh, outlets that they've sort of crossed that line, and they've gone to a point where the conduct has become anti-competitive, and it is harming consumers uh, because we lack choices, quality, innovation, um, and perhaps the prices paid by advertisers are too high, and that can trickle down to consumer prices as well. Jen, as you know so well, these things can take years and years to play out as a practical matter. But let's assume for the moment we get to a world in which Google says, okay, we won't pay the apples of this world and others to be the default search engine. Didn't the EU, the European Union, already have that kind of restriction on Google? Did it make any difference to their business? You know, they have, and, and people 
have said that it hasn't really worked out well, that it hasn't been a good enough remedy, although the European Commission is still looking at this and has suggested they think it actually is working out um, some of the options that Google has resorted to here in response to um, their abuse of dominance suit there. Uh, it hasn't hurt Google. What they have done is they've set up an auction and they've allowed uh, other search engines to be uh, give users being given an option to choose a search engine, Google and one of two others, um, as their default when they buy a device. So it's not automatically Google. Um, and, and you know, it it still remains to be seen. You know, has that really opened the door to other competitors um, and kind of challenged Google's foothold and dominance in that market? It's a little bit too soon. Right. But that is what the EU did. They said, Google, you have to get out of this exclusive agreement. You right. have to open the door to some of your rivals. Right. Let them get in there as the potential right. default search engine and, and see where this goes. And yep. it may be that that's where we end up in the U.S. as well. As I say, it's a long way to go, and we're going to get to talk to you quite often, I suspect. That's Jennifer Ree of Bloomberg Intelligence. Thanks so much. We turn now to Mark Crumpton for Bloomberg First Word News. David, thank you. Ahead of Thursday's debate, President Trump is complaining about the event's moderator. He's calling NBC News reporter Kristen Welker, quote, extraordinarily unfair, and again, quoting, a dyed-in-the-wool radical left Democrat. He has also criticized Fox News' Chris Wallace, who moderated the first 2020 debate. C-SPAN Steve Scully, who would have moderated the last debate if the president had not pulled out. And NBC's Savannah Guthrie, who hosted the president's town hall meeting. Mr. Trump and Joe Biden will be muted at times during Thursday's face-off. The Justice Department is charging Russian intelligence officers in cyber attacks that targeted a French presidential election, the Winter Olympics in South Korea, and American businesses. The DOJ says the scheme was aimed at boosting the Kremlin's geopolitical interests and destabilizing or punishing perceived enemies. The attacks caused billions of dollars in losses. UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson says bars and pubs in Manchester must close due to the spread of the coronavirus. Prime Minister Johnson's holding a news conference right now in London. He also put the Manchester area on a tier three COVID alert, which is the highest alert level. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thank you so much, Mark. Still ahead here, the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, will be here for an exclusive interview as the deadline for another round of stimulus draws near. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. As part of SIFMA's annual meetings this week, I sat down earlier with Roger Ferguson. He's CEO of TIAA, and he's also former vice chair of the Fed. And we discussed the state of the economy and the, the future, what, what the future holds for the recovery. At this stage, is its future is quite uncertain. Uh, because of uncertainty around fiscal policy, um, it's not clear how this is going to unfold uh, to the point that... Uh, my former colleagues and, and hopefully still friends at the Federal Reserve have been uh, asking uh, for more fiscal stimulus, highly unusual for the monetary policy leadership team at the very top to be encouraging Congress and the administration to develop another round of significant fiscal stimulus. So, you know, the, the short answer is recovery slowing, recovery very uneven, and recovery uh, becoming uh, more uncertain as we go forward. Uh, Roger, we've heard from many of our leaders, uh, particularly at the White House, uh, that in fact we're in better shape because the economy itself was structurally so strong going into this. If you compare us with some of the economies around the world, I'm not sure I see that. How do you see it? I, I have to say I agree with you. Um, while indeed there were elements of the economy that were strong going into this, some of the weaknesses uh, that were underlying all of that underneath it have become very, very apparent. You know, one of the things that was quite clear um, and has become even more clear was that the recovery had been you know, very uneven. Um, there are folks who still are feeling very left behind, uh, and those folks are probably even further behind now. And there are some, uh, mainly those who were investors in equity markets or worked in finance and a few other privileged sectors, uh, were doing quite well, but not everyone was. So I think the unevenness uh, of the early recovery has been unmasked, so to speak. 
Um, uh, the second thing I think we really understand is, um, at least at this stage of recovery, is heavily driven by you know stimulus, monetary and fiscal stimulus that was highly unprecedented. And that was true even earlier on. You know, very, very low interest rates were part of what was keeping the recovery going uh, even early on. And so I would say, you know, while, you know, the recovery is advancing um, and we started in a relatively strong place, there were some structural weaknesses, some underlying weaknesses that have been revealed uh, as a result of the pandemic crisis. Roger, you've mentioned a couple of times the unevenness of the recovery. Uh, go into that just a little bit. Is that an unevenness from your point of view by sector? For example, we see some of the, tra the transportation and the uh, hospitality areas really badly hit. Or is it also sort of socioeconomic? We see, for example, some minority communities have been particularly hard hit, uh, perhaps because of where they live, how they live, but also because of the jobs they tend to have. You put your finger on it. Uh, unevenness by sector, as you say, you know, transportation, hospitality, entertainment uh, have all been heavily hit. And we see, you know, layoffs coming from Disney and, you know, furloughs from the major airlines, that kind of thing. And that's playing through uh, even beyond to some of the providers for those sectors. Uh, the flip side has been, you know, the what I described earlier is the work from home sectors. So, you know, the the uh, the delivery, um, the the uh, Walmarts, et cetera, that are doing online delivery are seeing you know, relatively strong business, obviously, you know, Amazon famously so. And additionally, uh, we see unevenness in terms of what's driving uh, the stock market. Um, that has been you know, a very uneven, choppy market. Uh, and much of it is being driven by, again, technology companies. Um, and so even as we look at the stock market roughly recovering, we've seen unevenness there uh, with technology companies you know, playing a very important role uh, leading the stock market back. And unevenness, as you point out, across socioeconomic groups, you know, African Americans, other people of color, um, one, having jobs that leave them much more exposed, so called essential workers. Uh, secondly, you know, living often in places with poor health care, frankly, starting with uh, maybe more pre existing uh, conditions. So, you know, that's also a kind of unevenness that we're seeing here. Um, and so, you know, as, as we've said, uh, this is a tale of, of many cities. That was part of my interview with TIAA CEO Roger Ferguson. Since that interview, Mr. Ferguson has been said to be a possible candidate for Secretary of the Treasury in a Biden administration. Up next, our exclusive interview with Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, as we approach the deadline for a fourth round of fiscal stimulus. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power. I'm David Weston. We welcome now the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi, to our radio and TV listeners in the United States and in the United Kingdom on cable. Thank you so much, Speaker, for being with us. So uh, today is the deadline. You talked to George Stephanopoulos over the weekend, said 48 hours. That's up today. I understand you have a call scheduled with Secretary Mnuchin at 3 o'clock today, okay. Eastern Time. What are the prospects? What do you need to hear on that call to move forward? Well, first, let me uh, welcome you to the Speaker's office. I have behind me a great founder of the Republican Party, Abraham Lincoln, who said public sentiment is everything. With it, you can accomplish almost anything without it practically nothing. And I think the public sentiment is there for us to crush the virus. And that is our main goal in this legislation, so that we can open up our schools, open up our economy safely. There's no reason why our schools shouldn't be the safest place for our children to be, and that our workplace should be some place where workers can feel safe to come without fear of catching something that they bring home. So I'm optimistic because I do think we have a shared value, not many, but a shared value that finally is they want to crush the virus. And uh, that's been a change from even over the weekend when they put forth language that wasn't respectful of what we needed to do from the standpoint of science to crush the virus. We had to do to recognize the disproportionate spread of this virus in communities of color, where a child who is African-American would be five times more likely to go to the hospital with COVID than a white child, or a child who's Hispanic eight times more likely. So now they've come back and returned that language that addresses the disparity issues that is more scientific about testing tracing, 
treatment, wearing your mask, separation, sanitation, and the rest, because we can stop the spread as we hopefully <clears throat> wait the, uh, as the soon uh, uh, vaccine. We want it as soon as it is safe and efficacious, not one day later, but <clears throat> no one day sooner so, either. So Madam Speaker, from the beginning, you said that is your number one priority of crushing, mm -hmm. as you say, this virus. You've been mm -hmm. steadfast in that. Do you have language in front of you not right now that is close enough that you think you can get to a deal, at least in principle, in one more phone call with the Secretary of the Treasury? On that score, they've come a long way on that, I have to admit. So uh, oh, this morning, today, let me just say what the Tuesday, the 48 hours was yep. designed to do, for us to exchange all the unresolved issues. What is your best language? What is our best language? And let's see where we are. Now let's weigh the equities. We all want to get an agreement uh, because people need it and it's urgent and our economy needs it. And so uh, that's what, the, hopefully by the end of the day today, we'll know where, every, where we all are. Uh, we have one little bump in the road with the Appropriations Committee that is not sure they're gonna be ready, but let's hope they are. We're starting to write the bill and then we can have the negotiation. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. It is, you know, legislation is tough because you're coming from two different perspectives on it. But as long as we know that we want to keep the American people safe, that means, though, that we have to support our state and local, our first responders, our healthcare providers, our teachers, et cetera, that we have to depend on science to crush the virus. And we want to put money in the pockets of the American people so that they can have some confidence and spend in our consumer economy to uh, inject demand in, create, uh, create jobs. So, so take us through the process, if you could. Uh, you're in the room. We're not in the room. Yeah. What sort of language do you need to be able to say, yes, we think this will work? I assume you don't need the entire bill to be written. That takes some time. But what do you need to have yeah. reduced to writing so you know you have a meeting in the minds enough to say, yes, we can make this work? Well, the, uh, we are, again, uh, things have different weight. But as I said, uh, honor our heroes, crush the virus, money in the pockets of. And within those, we have to have more money for state and local because those are the people who meet our needs. They are getting fired, going on unemployment. That doesn't seem to make sense. So that's one place where we need more work. We have still some language that we have to deal with in terms of health beyond the, um, beyond the testing, tracing, treatment, mask, all that. We have to have better language, uh, improve the language on healthcare providers as well as the vaccine the vaccine, and it's within range. And then in terms of money in the pockets, we're still fighting for an earned income tax credit, child tax credit, refundability for the low income family, working families in our country. As you have seen the statistics over the weekend, six to eight million more people will be, fall into poverty because uh, of COVID. And we, need, we think we should be investing in them. Uh, economists tell us help the neediest, they'll spend it first. So it's the right thing to do from a compassion standpoint, but it is also from an economic standpoint. So and then we just have some differences within there. But now, now one big, but the two bookends of our differences right now, since you asked, one is uh, state and local and the other is liability. And right now, mm -hmm. by the time I speak to the secretary uh, at three o'clock, I think that we will have language countering what they have in the bill because safety in the workplace for us is not an issue. It's not a provision of a bill. It is a value. These families, many of them essential workers, go to work. If they don't, they don't even get unemployment insurance if they're concerned about going to work because they might catch the virus because the provisions haven't taken place. So again, safety in the workplace, very important. I'm hoping that we can come to terms on that. So those are the two bookends. In between, we have some differences. And of course, they don't want to do anything for elections. I'm very concerned about what they're doing on census. Uh, it, it's, it's so unconstitutional. Um, but uh, again, uh, we may have to live to fight another day on that. I, I don't know. They don't, they've said they have no movement on the census, which is in defiance of the Constitution of the United mm -hmm. States, that every person in the country should be counted. The Supreme Court just ruled in favor of the president that he could stop counting people, but the Congress can change that. 
and that's what we hope to do. Madam Speaker, I, I would love it if you'd want to negotiate this with me. You're not going to do that. <laughs> I recognize that. But can you give me this sort of sense? When it comes to that liability, one of the two bookends you described, yeah. is yeah. it binary? That to say, is it all or nothing, or can there be some wiggle room in between so that there's some language the Republicans could accept, but it goes farther than what the current law is? Well, the, 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 to understand that issue the, the, in this legislation, what Senator McConnell has in there is something that is not coronavirus-centric. It's for four years. It applies to all kinds of other things, and it's, it's not to the point. So that language should easily be changed. You know, he's doing a tort reform when we're trying to do safety in the workplace. Now, they have come uh, to good language on OSHA, our, our safety provisions, uh, in the bill, but their overarching McConnell language negates the, the OSHA regulation. So we're saying, if you believe that it doesn't negate it, write that into the land. Not, nothing in this bill shall undermine the ability of OSHA. You know, th that's a traditional thing that we do. Mm -hmm. So that's one place. Now, I do believe that, um, uh, that it's, if someone is uh, honoring the OSHA provisions, having good working standards and the rest, that could be an admissible defense so should someone um, um, bring a case against them. So, I, you know, I think that there is a balance that can be struck, but it isn't the, it isn't the McConnell language. Uh, but we'll have our language to them. We're working very hard to protect the workers, but also to be able to come to an agreement. Uh, that's very helpful, actually. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. Uh, give us some sense at the end of the day, whenever that is, tonight or whenever it is, um, uh, how will we learn whether we may have a deal or not? I mean, uh, I don't want to be sacrilegious. It's not choosing a pope, but what's going to be the puff of smoke? <laughs> will, you, will you tell us? Will you, will you announce to the world, yes, I think we may have a deal, or you know what, the deal's off? Well, the deal, let me just say, it isn't that this day was a day that we would have a deal. It was a day where right. we would have our terms on the table to be able to go to the next step. And again, but legislation takes a long time. You have to have the, every provision, you have to have the Congressional Budget Office uh, score it, the uh, uh, Legislative Council to review it. So these things take time. It's not just sending you a note. Uh, it's, a, it's legislation. And it's what I love to do. I'm a legislator. They're not necessarily legislators, so uh, we, I'm trying to impress upon them if we want to have this by election day, and I think we can, you have to engineer back from there to this week. Now, if we have our terms on the table, they may not be in agreement, but at least there's a decision to be made as to what's more important or less important in light of weighing the equities to have an agreement. And then in the next day or so, I, I'm not sure they're gonna be ready with their uh, appropriations language. I hope so, but so far it's a little bit behind and for what we've heard, from there. Now, I'm an appropriator, and I think left to their own device, devices, left to their own devices, the appropriators, Democrats and Republicans working together, can bring us to agreement. Uh, I think the secretary believes that. I'm hoping that they are left to their own devices. And so, again, uh, it's a, as I say to everyone, you're not going to love everything in here. It's right. a negotiation. Right. Right. It's legislation. Exactly. Let's do exactly what you said. Let's go forward to Election Day and back time it, as we say in the, in the broadcasting business. What do we okay. have to do between here and there to get there? Uh, assuming that you do have the basic terms you've worked out and you work yeah. on, when do you have to have the language of a bill? When do you have to call back your members for a vote? How, what does the next week or 10 days look like? Well, of course, the, the final piece is the president signing the legislation. And, and uh, for that to happen, it has to pass the House but it has to pass the Senate. And you know we're getting mixed messages. The Senate's saying one thing, the president says he wants to spend more money than I do. But as I've said before, it's not about the money, it's how the money is spent. We know we want a child tax credit for the poorest kids in America. They want to retain a tax uh, net operating loss benefit for the wealthiest people in our country. And we're saying, well, you know, how do we reconcile that? So Which was in the CARES the Act, right? That was actually in the CARES Act. In the CARES, and we take it out, and they're insisting on keeping it in. So as I say, it's it's never not always just the price. It's the money and how it is spent. So that's that's one thing. So anyway, engineering back the, to have it for election day, we, I, I would think we'd have to have this finished by the end of next week. In order for that to do it, we'd have to have 
our legislation all written by the end of this week, then it's, you know, you have all your procedural 72 hours of review for the world to see, and then, and then it would come to the floor, and then the Senate, you know, has different procedures, so it would have to be, a, but this is really to have it for, now I'm not, you know, we, we could still do, continue the negotiation. It might not be finished uh, by election day. Right. It may be finished by election day, but I want it by the file next Friday. See, I wanted it at a time where people could pay the rent. November right. 1st, rent day. Right. Let's see if we can't do that. If that's not possible, it doesn't mean we that the virus should not still be crushed, uh, that we shouldn't be putting money in the pockets of the American people, that we shouldn't be honoring our heroes. We still should have a responsibility uh, to continue the negotiations should we just not uh, come to enough of an agreement, a reconciliation of our differences. But I'm, we're on a path. We're on a path, and, and you have to be optimistic. As I say, the secretary and I say to each other, if we didn't believe we could get this done, why would we even be talking you to know, each no. other? It, it, it's it's fiendishly complicated and difficult and important. Uh, we're all very interested, as you can tell. There is a third party in this negotiation, which is the majority leader, uh, as you've referred to him two or three times now. Are you confident that, if in fact, you can come to terms with the White House, with the Treasury Secretary, and therefore presumably with the president, that the Republicans in the Senate will come along? Well, the president says they will. And uh, the, the, the president has sent... Secretary Mnuchin to, for this negotiation. We've ne negotiated many packages, keeping government open on more than one occasion, uh, negotiating appropriations and omnibus bills. Uh, we've, we've had four COVID very bipartisan bills that we have negotiated. And people say to me now, why would you give the president a victory by getting this done? And I said, well, if there's collateral benefit for him, who cares? What we are worried, concerned about are working families in our country. Same as they said when we did, as I've said to you before, when we did the U.S.-Mexico-Canada free trade agreement, they sent us a terrible bill, disastrous for the environment, for American workers and the rest, but we improved the bill, we negotiated, and, and people said, well, that gives a victory to the president. I said, no, it gives a victory to America's workers. He's not that important that we would negate any avoid an opportunity to help workers just because he would have collateral benefit. Now he brags about it, but it has no resemblance to the bill that he put forward. But nonetheless, okay, we negotiated, and it's the law. And uh, I think it, I think it could be not everybody doesn't agree with me, but I think it could be a template for other trade agreements to be made easier by setting certain standards that we agree to in a bipartisan way. Same thing with this. We can't make matters worse. People say, except, except what they're saying. Well, that's not an agreement, except what they're saying. But again, we can't make matters worse for families that are going into poverty, the, the raging uh, coronavirus. I don't know who was advising the president on testing and the rest, mm -hmm. but finally they came around to the fact uh, that they, we had to do the testing. So that was, that was a big improvement over the weekend. Okay, Madam Speaker, we will all be lo looking at this very carefully, as you know. We're waiting for every word from your lips. Thank you so much. It's always great to have you with us. That's the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi. And thanks to our radio listeners, including in the UK on the cable. Coming up, we continue our look at the swing state of Pennsylvania with its former governor, Mark Schweiker. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Our Swing State series continues, focusing on this week on Pennsylvania. And welcome now the Commonwealth's former Republican governor, Mark Schweiker. So, Governor, thank you so much for being with us. We are going through Pennsylvania all week long to try to understand it as we move up to this election just two weeks away. What do you think we should know about Pennsylvania, which is, we all agree, a key to this election? Sure. Well, I, I, you know, a couple of reactions, David. First is this is going to be a nose-to-nose -nose horse race right up until 8 p.m. on election night just two weeks from now. And, you know, likely uh, the, the prospect of not knowing who's the out-and-out -out victor that evening uh, could be the, the case. But, you know, I, what, I, what I see are the dynamics for this horse race. You've got uh, certainly uh, an attractive uh, Democratic nominee in Joe Biden who 
you know, talks about his roots, and it, particularly in northeastern Pennsylvania, the town of Scranton. Uh, Donald Trump, who really came from behind in 2016, much like you've got dynamically in 2020. So it, it's going to be nose to nose. I saw an interesting fact to it the other day, David, uh, that kind of runs against the idea that, uh, and no question, mathematically, the, the uh, write-in ballots on the Democratic side are kind of outgunning the Republican side as much as seven to two. So something to watch. I bet the other dynamic to watch is, you know, the, these younger uh, as they say, non-college educated white male voters uh, from these rural addresses, from these rural areas. And those registration numbers are off the charts in favor of the Republicans. So it might balance each other. We shall see. Well, it's interesting you say that, Governor, because we heard something similar actually in Florida, where the registrations for Republicans are really up in, in the state. You talk about the non-college educated white males. Is this a battle between Philadelphia on the one hand and the west of the state on the other? Well, I don't think you can reduce it, uh, it to simple geographic contrast points, David. I, you know, I don't think any of us doubt the idea that among uh, suburban women, there's, a, there's a, a great deal of concern and indifference toward the president's reelection, but also across the Commonwealth among Democratic women in some of these rural states. Remember, there was one political consultant who referred to Pennsylvania, at least in the rural areas, as Pennsylvania in a play on words of Pennsylvania and Kentucky. Uh, and so I, I'm not convinced that those Democratic women uh, are enamored with a, a Biden candidacy as well. So in my mind, I think it all points to this horse race metaphor that I shared just a couple of minutes ago. That, I mean, we've got 14 days to go on this Tuesday that we talk, and I, you know, it's, it's highly competitive. So I don't think it's, it's just ge geography. You know, if I go, you know, uh, certainly, you know, my wife and I are here and raised our kids here in Pennsylvania as well and still plugged in. And, you know, when I see a thousand vehicles uh, traveling, uh, trucks and small trucks and regular family SUVs and cars out there honking the horns for Donald Trump, and then you see big numbers, not as big numbers turn out for Joe Biden, it, it really creates a sense of uh, not just contrast, but wonderment about who's going to show up in two weeks on election day. I think, as it always is, uh, you know, turnout will be key. So, so, Governor, you have run for elective office, and therefore you know to be skeptical of polls. You have to be very careful because the polls can really mislead you. Give us a sense of Pennsylvania polls right now, because it's quite close, although apparently uh, the former Vice President Biden appears to be ahead. Could the polls be fooling sure. us in Pennsylvania? I, I, I think that dynamic is there. I mean, look, we're all tuned in in 2020 and wired in. We've got our iPhones and, the you know, the... You know, you have to wonder, are these polling models, uh, despite, the, you know, their exertions on the part of these firms, that they are reaching out to uh, mobile phone users? You know, we don't know. C can't be sure. But, but as, as I see it, uh, you know, the, the, this, uh, you know, we often talk about there's not one poll nationally. There's really 50 state polls. In a play on numbers, David, I would say that in Pennsylvania, there's 67 polls based on the 67 counties. Hmm. You know, if this were only to the suburban or rural areas, I think Donald Trump runs away with it. Uh, but when you throw in the urban areas, you know, the big, uh, the big urban environments of Pittsburgh in the West, uh, and, and by the way, people often say that the Midwest starts just west of Pittsburgh to give you a feel for, to give your viewers a feel for the attitudes and the values that pervade those counties. But Pittsburgh in the West and Philadelphia in the East, uh, that, you know, y you see that, that geographic battle that you, you brought up a couple of moments ago. But l let me throw in another dynamic, which I think kind of uh, historically correlates to what we, we saw in 2016 when Donald Trump came from behind, seemingly in the last 10 days, to overtake Hillary Clinton, who was, a, 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 in a singular way, a, a qualified candidate for president. Uh, and, they, you know, they, it, it's, it's, a, it's a comparison to what went on in the U.K., uh, in the 90s when uh, Margaret Thatcher was the PM. Over there, they call it the, the, uh, the Tory effect, the shy Tory effect, as in the Tory party. Now, we all know that she was on the right, Tories liked her, uh, and you had many folks on the left uh, who really would not express openly and publicly that they favored Maggie Thatcher, and they would not answer forthrightly in polls. And yet she won again and again and again. And they, they, were, they were shy. They were not willing to express how they felt about Maggie Thatcher. Thus, the reference to the shy Tory effect. Right. Well, 
if there's anything to that in 2020 and after what we saw in 2016, right. what's to stop any uh, individual from suggesting that Donald Trump has the, 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 the makings of coming from behind again in Pennsylvania? And finally, Governor, I'm going to do what we do, ask an unfair question because it's a long question. Now, don't have much time. But basically, you've done a lot with business since you left being lieutenant governor and governor of Pennsylvania. You've done a lot with business. Which of the two candidates, Joe Biden or Donald Trump, is going to be better for business? Well, I, I think the needle points to Donald Trump. Uh, uh, th after all, aside from, well, let's 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 be sober about this and, and step away from our feelings about his style and approach. Uh, economically, we were rolling right up until March 1. And I think if the election were held March 2nd, D Donald Trump, at least in Pennsylvania, and I would think nationally, would have been a very strong contender for re-election. So I, I think his acuity, I think his sentimental take on what it takes to help Main Street or the big Fortune 100 uh, companies is, is strong. I think Joe Biden, certainly, you know, that he uh, worked very closely uh, with uh, President Obama certainly was a big supporter of, of President Clinton at the time as a member of the U.S. Senate representing Delaware. And really, he's got strong credentials as well. But I think at the end of the day, you know, whether it's the chambers of Congress or uh, 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 of uh, commerce to, you know, business advocacy groups, I think there is a decided right. comfort with Donald Trump's take on public policy when it relates to supporting business, small and large. Okay, we're gonna have to leave it there, but it was a great pleasure having you with us. That was very helpful. That is the former Pennsylvania governor. He is Mark Schweiker. And a programming note now, live coverage of the final presidential debate begins Thursday night at 8.30 p.m. Eastern time on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Former Defense Secretary Leon Panetta and pollster Frank Luntz will be among our guests. Coming up, Balance of Power continues on Bloomberg Radio. In our second hour, we'll talk to former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers and one of his former Harvard students. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio.